This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you're tuned in to When Science Speaks. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists and engineers get funding, gain influence, and build relationships with the stakeholders who matter most. It is such a great pleasure to have Dr. Tracy Delgado on the show today. Dr. Delgado is Associate Professor of Biology at Seattle Pacific University with a teaching focus in cell biology. Tracy finds teaching undergraduates to be very rewarding because it allows her to train, motivate, and shape the lives of her students by instilling knowledge they can use for a lifetime. It's estimated that about 15% of cancers are caused by virus infections, and Tracy's research focuses on understanding understanding how herpes viruses can cause cancer and also identifying drugs to combat virus infections. Tracy's TEDx talk is titled The Future of Antiviral Therapy and it highlights her research and the, the URL will be in the show notes for today's episode. One of Tracy's passions is to help increase underrepresented minorities in the sciences. Tracy's a member of the National Society for Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in the Sciences, which is SACNAS. She earned her PhD in microbiology at University of Washington and her BS in microbiology, immunology, and genetics from UCLA. You can check out in the show notes her professor website. Welcome to the show, Tracy. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Mark. I'm really um, looking forward to talking to you today. So I would like to talk to you first about your own professional your own personal journey, actually, before we get to the professional journey, about growing up in East LA and, and how that experience has shaped your research and fueled your passion for increasing the number of underrepresented minorities in the sciences. Yeah, so I grew up in, like you mentioned, in East LA, and I grew up in a pretty predominantly Hispanic, Latino, Latinx community and the city of Bell, which is kind of in Southeast LA. And uh, growing up in that community, we were over, there was overpopulation, um, lower uh, social economic status uh, throughout the whole community, a lot of poverty and uh, going into to school and really wanting to, you know, make something of myself was something that was uh, really challenging just in general due to the lack of resources and the lack of, um, I guess, even just good science equipment and uh, curriculum that can really be managed. I mean, the teachers did the best they can, but when they're overpopulated and in those type of situations and not enough money, it's really hard to set your, your students for success. Mm. Um, and as I went through through high school, especially that's kind of when you're really thinking about your trade and what you want to do. Um, I was in the honors program, which was, uh, I think, really fortunate because there was a higher success of college. Probably about 10% of us went to college. Mm. Um, but when I looked at kind of just in general, you know, the students who came into high school and by the time we all left half of them had dropped out mm -hmm. there was a lot of demand for you know helping out your families and working or maybe just not a lot of emphasis on education and um, really lack of role models uh, for people who look like you and who are successful and so that was something that I experienced um, a lot in in high school really wanting to make something of myself but feeling I didn't have the resources or the mentors that I needed to Make something of myself and so part of what i've been doing as i've gone up through college and graduate school and even a professor is i really want to make a difference in providing students of um, similar backgrounds mentorship uh, and role models to really show them that they can make it and i think there's a huge impact on that being able to have people who look like you or who come from similar backgrounds and really see wow there is people who came from, you know, here from Bell or East LA and they made it to a professor and how did you do that? And understanding cultural, you know, backgrounds and kind of family uh, and how, how family works in that particular culture and support, I think is really important. So um, 
So yeah, it's pretty much because of my own experience of feeling I needed more support than I had um, and not enough resources. As I went on through my career trajectory, I really felt the need to help, whether it be through mentorship, community outreach, giving talks or inspirational talks or um, volunteering to, you know, mentor individual students throughout, you know, not just at my university, but in other places around the country. Uh, there's many ways to help people out who may be experiencing that same type of um, background. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Such an important, inspirational message. And, you know, really, as you underlined, a lot of times it can be a situation where um, you, if you don't have the role models and you don't have a full understanding of even what's possible mm -hmm. and um, to have, you know, such an impactful professor, like as you are talking and giving these, you know, giving the exposing and talking about your experience, which might be similar in some ways to your audiences, that absolutely must be such a great motivator for students who might otherwise not really even think they, they could reach such heights. Yeah. Um, what I'd like you to talk about now is sort of, okay, you, you, you were in high school, you explained your situa the situation there. Um, now you get, to, you, you get to UCLA, you know, you're in the honors program in high school, you get to UCLA, you're ready to begin your studies. What were some of the challenges that you faced and how were you able to overcome them when you, when you arrived? Yeah, the challenges are major, I have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you leave high school at the top of your class and you realize you go to a university where you're at the lowest of, you know, that kind of um, academic rigorousness compared to other, you know, students who had mm -hmm. better preparedness from their high schools. Uh, and so I went in and I, you know, I luckily had a really good AP teacher for biology in high school who really pushed me to, you know, say I could do it and help me find a major. And so when I got there, she's like, you should try something like a PhD or an MD or, or MD PhD program, you know, mm -hmm. for your future aspirations post-college. So I was like, okay, well, let me see. So I went in, started in the biology major. And one of the first true tests is chemistry because it's, mm -hmm. you know, everybody has to take general chemistry when you first start. And it's definitely a very difficult uh, start. And I went in and I realized I knew nothing. Um, unfortunately, my high school teacher at the time when I took honors chemistry um, didn't teach us in high school. He taught us for about a week and have us turn in assignments and never graded them and basically he gave you grades based off of whether he liked you or not. Huh. Uh, and it was a very unfortunate situation because I came in with no chemistry. So I come into, you know, on, you know, to university chemistry and they start talking about these, you know, significant figures and balancing reactions and never done that before, mm -hmm. which I should have done as an honors chemistry student uh, and in high school. So I panicked <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what's going on. Everybody seems to know what's going on. Uh, you feel that imposter syndrome, like I should be here, like I don't know what I'm doing. So um, I mean, some people choose to give up at this point and just leave, but I really wanted, I had that determination. I wanted to be successful in science. So I took the, I dropped that first week after the, maybe the second day of class. And I went back to my high school and found a different chemistry uh, professor, not professor, teacher, who um, didn't teach me, but it was a different one. Um, and she said, here's a chemistry book and study over Christmas break and take chemistry again in the winter. So I basically did that, you, you know, kind of my own determination of, I had to kind of make up for the lack of um, preparation that I didn't have you know, I wasn't given that preparation. So I spent Christmas break, you know, going through textbooks and uh, chemistry textbooks and teaching myself. And then I came back in and I was able to pass. It wasn't a great grade. I actually struggled a lot the first year. I got a lot of C's and it was enough to get by, but not enough to be successful for what I want to do. Um, and so eventually I ended up um, going into different programs um, or finding minority programs that were on campus that helped give tutoring for students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. And so through that, I was able to um, find other people like me who came from those backgrounds mm -hmm. and pretty much gave me that opportunity to um, get tutored and catch up kind of on that academic deficit. Right. And then as I went on uh, through time, I ended up finding um, a mentor 
Her name is Alma Gonzalez, Dr. Alma, Alma Gonzalez. She was one of the first PhD scientists in the biological sciences as a Latina, uh -huh. uh, whoever got her PhD. And so she was, she became my mentor and I was in an honors research program that she ran and my grades through that program, I found study groups and learned how to study and met other people just like me. And then eventually I was able to go ahead and get better grades and those C's became B's and B's became A's uh, and was able to kind of reach a level where I felt like I can actually be successful <laughs> instead of feeling like a failure. Yeah. Uh, so it was a lot of mentorship, a lot of finding not only people that looked like me and understood my journey, but also um, from you know higher level than me, say a professor, but also peer mentors, people who came from the East LA or South Central or other parts of LA uh, and have that similar background and also, you know, helping each other study and test each other and quiz each other, which was skills I didn't have before or even knew. So Tracy, I want to ask you now, so you're in the honors program in high school, you graduate and then you arrive on campus at UCLA. Can you walk listeners through what that was like? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was it was really hard uh, just to be completely honest it was um, pretty much just a shock uh, if you've ever heard of the word imposter syndrome that's pretty much what I felt I felt like I didn't belong and uh, and I wasn't prepared like all of my other um, peers were uh, in my similar classes and so uh, I chose to go into science mainly or at least major in science or biology uh, when I was in high school, I had an AP biology teacher who was actually, who was very excellent, excellent. And she guided me and really believed in me and said, you know, you, you are going to do big things. And when you go to college, uh, after you're done, you want to prepare yourself to get an advanced degree, such as an MD or a PhD or both. And she's like, you're going to want to do this major and you want to take chemistry as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So I got to college and the first quarter was chemistry. Uh, and uh, chemistry, as you might've heard in science majors is, um, really hard to pass. Uh, it's pretty much uh, known as a weeder in some cases uh, and kind of see who's cut out to continue. Uh, and so I came in and I was looking, you know, the first day of class, I realized I was highly unprepared. Unfortunately, when I was in high school, when I took so-called honors chemistry, I had a teacher who was uh, not really teaching. He, you know, maybe taught us for the first couple weeks of class and gave us some homework and kept assigning us things, but we pretty much never got them graded. He never taught us um, certain, co any chemistry concepts. And in the end, your grade was based off of whether he liked you or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very unfortunate situation. I felt like my education, you know, was, you know, I, I felt robbed in a sense of, of an experience that I should have known and felt like I was set up for failure. Mm -hmm. And so getting into chemistry and it's like, you know, a, pretty much a college level UCLA chemistry class and a weeder and you make or break you kind of situation. And I realized there was no way this is going to break me. And so, um, but I also, but pretty much this is a decision where students decide I'm done. I, I can't do this. And so I had to make a, a decision and say, no, I really want to be a scientist. So I'm going to figure out another way, even though I wasn't prepared. So I talked to a different um, chemistry teacher from my high school, not the one I had, but a different one. And she said, here's a chemistry book. Um, you're going to, you should uh, read this book and learn from it during Christmas break and then take chemistry again in the winter. So I said, okay. Uh, so I, I think I contacted her like the first week of classes. So within the first week, I dropped chemistry a fall quarter and I made that plan to study chemistry on my own during Christmas break. And in the winter, I entered chemistry again. And this time I stayed in the class and I passed. In my past, I think it meant like I got a C, which is to be completely honest was enough for me just because I, it was just, it was just, you know, this brand new world of, uh, in I just was not prepared compared to everybody else who was, who was, you know, ready to go and had better background um, educational experiences. And that pretty much that trend continued for most of first year and into second year. I got C's and eventually some B's, um, but it wasn't enough to get into what I wanted, which was good to go to graduate school. Um, and so um, how I ended up progressing and getting over my challenges was one is I found uh, minority or program or for students from disadvantaged backgrounds where they give free tutoring and study groups 
to help you get through these tough classes because they do realize there is a lot of students who are unprepared um, for college and want to make sure that they're successful. So that helped a lot. I met a lot of people through that program. And then the next kind of big highlight was my, I met uh, my mentor who's still my mentor now. Her name is Dr. Alma Gonzalez. And she was um, the first Latina to get a PhD in the biological sciences pretty much here in the United States. Wow. So it's a pretty big, yeah, it was like pretty, pretty awesome to have someone like that as your role model who understood the background and the challenges, um, the culture and, you know, family background and just trying to be successful. So she mentored myself and many other students who are interested in a research career. Um, it was a program called the Minority Access to Research Careers, um, funded by the National Institutes of Health. And so she uh, was able to get us research experience and we were able to find community with other students uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds or minority backgrounds. And that really helped to get to the next level, which is to get to graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's two things. We have the role models, people who look like you, who know the challenges, who, who know um, pretty much you know, what it's like to come from that type of background. And then two is uh, you end up having students or peers who have backgrounds like that as well. Mm -hmm. So they, you can relate to each other, vent to each other, help each other out, you know, as in classes, we took a lot of the same lab classes and lecture classes and just studied together and really encouraged each other. So by the time I got through junior year, you know, I'm getting more B's and some A's. And by the time I got to senior year, I got almost straight A's. So it was just a big progression um, in that to, you know, go from basically almost failing, which is like a C minus in sciences to getting straight A's. And you're just like, wow, this is, this has, you know, this, I was able to do it. I was able to you know, overcome these educational deficiencies that I started with. Absolutely. That is really so powerful. I mean, you essentially took a year of honors chemistry over your winter break in college while yeah, you had all, this other, <laughs> all these other responsibilities and things going on in your life. And I want to ask you how you felt after you got through that course a second time and you passed that course and you did it basically completely on your own um, while other students really probably had, you know, they were kind of taking chemistry, at least for the second time, right? If they had taken a bona fide class, you know, in mm -hmm. high school. So when they sat down the first day of honors chemistry, or chemistry at UCLA, it was like, at least the beginning was almost like a review, probably. Um, and you had really pretty much zero chemistry before, before then. And then you go back and teach yourself how to do it on your own. Like, how did you feel at the end of that class when you passed it? I mean, I think it was a bittersweet kind of feeling. I think, you know, sweet in the sense that I did it. I was able to pass mm -hmm. and continue into my dream, you know, of getting this degree and going on to graduate school. Mm -hmm. But I think also bitter in the sense of, you know, I still didn't get an A. I still didn't get a B, you know, and if I need to do better, you know, if I don't, if I don't do better, you know, I, I could get C's all day, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to get into graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you put in all this hard work and, you know, it pays off, but also not fully. And I, you know, I had to, you know, and I, as, as I look through time, I realized like, you know, I had a huge leap that I had, and then, you know, it was kind of like stairs, you know, everybody's going up one step. I had mm -hmm. to go up like, you know, 20 steps or something, mm -hmm. you know, and that's this, if I was only able to go up through 10, that's still way more than everybody else, but it felt like it wasn't in some way. So it was just knowing I just had to do better and keep doing my best. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, realizing I did need more resources. I did need other strategies to study and peers to do study group with mm -hmm. and, you know, if I could talk to my old self now, write down all these little, you know, study tips, you know, I wish I could sure. go back and be like, this is everything you need to do. Just like I do with my students. This is what you need to do to be successful. Didn't have anybody do that for me. Right. Um, right. So I think that's, you know, the bittersweet, but I mean, definitely very proud of myself that I was able to get through that, but also unfortunate that I couldn't just, you know, take those 10 steps and get ahead of everybody instead of right. just like average for a little right. bit. Right. In yeah. the moment at the, at the time is different. In the moment. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
so I actually want to follow up something that you just alluded to, Tracy, which is, you know, the messages that you give to your students now, because there may be listeners who are out there who may relate to that situation, you know, who, who basically had to work twice as hard because they didn't receive the instruction that they should have received, you know, from an academic standpoint. And they could be listening right now and feeling some of the same things that you felt um, when you were back at UCLA. So what sort of messages do you share with your students and could you share with our listeners in that regard? Sure. Normally, I, when I first start a class, I usually give them a little sneak peek at my journey, my academic journey, and I tell them, when I first took biology, for example, if I'm teaching general biology, I got a C or a C plus or something. And look at me now, I'm a PhD professor, you know, here. And it was more of, you know, like your early failures don't necessarily dictate your future mm -hmm. um, in the sense where, you know, failure seems like a C because you want to go to med school or graduate school and you need ACE, um, but realizing that there's a lot of opportunities to get better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mainly the message I try and give them is you could fail first exam and you could still do better. Like there was, you know, one chemistry exam, I got a D, I think it was like my third chemistry class. And then I worked really, really hard and I studied for 24 seven. And then I got an A on the mm -hmm. second exam. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know it was possible. Uh -huh. And so that determination to telling them about determination is really important. Mm -hmm. um, second, finding resources to help. I tell them a little bit about the resources that are found on campus, tutoring, um, as study groups, the importance of study groups, which I didn't learn really until junior year. Mm -hmm. And I wish I would have done that earlier, um, how to test themselves, how to take good notes and also come to me for help. I know professors can be pretty intimidating sometimes. And I know sometimes I can even come off intimidating. I'm not trying to. Uh, and so, you know, to, to know that your professors are there for you to help you be successful. So see them during office hours, especially in a small university like mine, where my class size, you know, usually less than 35. Mm -hmm. You know, there's great opportunity to get to know your professors and ask them questions about the material and get clarifications. And so utilizing all the resources, there's no shame in using resources that are available. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're there and, and most of the time they're free, you should take advantage um, because you just don't know when, you know, you won't be able to have those type of resources in a, say, another class or something like mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Tracy. And I want to talk about an organization that you're really active in called the Society for Advancement for Chicanos and Native Americans or SACNIS. Some of our listeners may be familiar with SACNIS. What can you tell us about your experience with SACNIS and you know what you're up to with SACNIS these days? Yeah, so SACNIS, uh, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in the Sciences was actually uh, interestingly, the, the story of how it was founded is pretty interesting. Uh, this is, I think it was maybe 45 to 50 years ago, there was a couple Chicano, uh, Chicana and Native American scientists at a big science conference. And they got, they, you know, people of similar backgrounds like to gravitate towards each other. And they got in an elevator. And the story goes that they joked about how if the elevator were to break and fall, you would wipe out all the people that come from that background. <laughs> it's in sciences. So basically you, you wipe out all the like Chicano, Chicana and Native Americans in the sciences. United States. And they said, that is a huge issue, especially if you can fit them all in an elevator and wipe them out in like one second. So they said, we should do something about that. So they started a society, which is the Sockness Society, to help increase the number of underrepresented minorities in the sciences. So then they kind of found other scientists through the time, including my mentor, Alma, Dr. Alma Gonzalez. And it started, you know, with those, you know, seven or 11 something like that, professors to, you know, now there's, you know, 5,000 people who go to the conference every year. Mm. And this, so it started off as professors and then it moved on into undergraduates. So really that kind of tiered mentorship, which is, you know, professors or people who have, you know, higher degrees or just leadership skills um, or time in the field, you know, mentoring the next generations. Mm -hmm. And so pretty much the conference led to about half of them being undergrads, like 2000 undergrads go to this conference every year, which changes um, every year in this different cities mm -hmm. around the United States. And I went as an undergrad. I went when I was a junior um, undergraduate and I got to present my research and you hear keynote talks from big shot people 
and scientists and engineers and mathematicians. It's um, STEM, which is science, math, um, science, uh, math, engineering, technolo technology, mm -hmm. um, or actually science, technology, STEM. engineering, and math, STEM. Uh, yeah. And you know, you're, you're seeing all these big shot people giving these keynote talks that look like you, who come from similar backgrounds. It kind of you know, recharges you. If you've ever been to a conference and you feel energized, you're just like, yeah, like they did it. I can do it too. And otherwise you would never see these people. Mm -hmm. You would never know of these people and you get to make connections and make mentors and find fr long lasting friendships who can help guide you through the most difficult times of your academic journey. Mm -hmm. And so really that was amazing because I got to go as an undergrad and then as the, in graduate school, um, they just started chapters at local universities of SACNIS. Mm -hmm. And so my second year, a new SACNIS chapter started, which I was a part of. And that really helped mentorship and support and community within each other at the graduate level mm -hmm. to kind of get through our PhD and survive. <laughs> and again, similar cultural expectations and other things going on and family expectations. So that really helped guide us through that. So it was nice because SACNIS was really starting to branch, not just from faculty and undergrads, but then into graduate school mm -hmm. or people in their um, different types of career backgrounds and mm -hmm. sciences and, um, or I guess in STEM in general. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice because you can, you could be your whole self. You could be fully, I can be a fully Latina and also fully a scientist. You don't have to worry about like wearing my Latina earrings, but at the same time talking cool science about cancer and viruses, mm -hmm. you know, I could, you could be your whole self and see a bunch of people that are all wanting the same thing, which is to grow and, you know, be successful in the sciences. Yeah, I, I just love that so much. And I'm going to get your research in one quick second. But I want to ask you about SOCNIS this year as far as the conference. It's there is going to be yeah. a virtual conference or any type of thing, like how, how it's going to be, um, you know, organized for, for this year, for 2020. Yeah, I haven't heard. I mean, they just announced, I think it was last week or a couple of days ago that it's going to be virtual. Uh, they haven't given us too much information, but um, I'm assuming they'll probably have some keynote speakers online or presentations either pre-recorded or through some sort of Zoom platform. Um, I would also think that like one of the things that I love every year participating in is a special session called one-on-one um, -on -one mentoring. And they give a bunch of undergraduates a one-on-one -on -one 45 minute mentorship experience mm -hmm. with someone who's already like finished or you know already a career person mm -hmm. so professor or administrator or something uh, and you just meet with these students and you talk to them about their dreams and their challenges and struggles and you help them you know wrestle through that almost like counseling half counseling half mentorship you know that's mm -hmm. kind of what mentorship is in some yeah. aspects and you really get to know them and help them you know figure out what to do next or how to study or you know, what great graduate programs there is or anything like that. So I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're going to do that virtually as well, where you probably meet with the mentor sometime during the conference and you do Zoom or something like that, you know, however they're going to set up their platform. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm curious to see how it's looking like as well, uh, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. Sure. on how that looks like. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so valuable to have the conference and I'm glad it will happen. Um, yeah. You know, even if it's virtual, still get so much value out of it. I want to turn to your research, which is fascinating. Um, you know, for listeners, just overall studying how viruses, you know, particularly the herpes, vi herpes virus can cause cancer. And I'd love for you to share with our listeners about your research, you know, some of your findings, maybe how you even, you know, came to this sort of um, path or, you know, maybe like line of inquiry, because it is so interesting and so important, particularly these days. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so when I was an undergrad, I uh, started uh, doing research in a cancer biology lab, and I thought cancer was interesting. I mean, it's also a big health disparity for access and treatments. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to understand more about how cancer worked, but I was also a microbiology major and I was starting to become fascinated with viruses. And I did a summer internship at Harvard uh, doing virus work the summer between my junior and senior year. So I kind of fell in love with viruses, mm -hmm. but also was really interested in cancer research. So when I got to graduate school, I, I found a lab, a mentor or a professor who could, who I can do my PhD in, 
or in his lab, and we were studying how viruses cause cancer. So it's best of both worlds. You could study cancer and how viruses do that. Mm -hmm. And um, what we see is, you know, about 15% of cancers are caused by viruses. And some, in, some common ones include human papilloma virus, which causes cervical cancer, or um, Epstein-Barr virus, which causes um, mono in some cases, but can cause uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. So there's, those are just some examples. And so yeah, there's also, uh, so as I was going through, through graduate school, I really was interested in how a virus can cause cancer because the virus is just looking out for itself. I mean, it's not alive, but it wants to replicate itself. So a virus is not like infecting a cell and thinking, oh, I want to cause cancer in you. It's thinking, how do I make more of myself and spread? Like mm -hmm. that's their goal. And uh, one of the hallmarks kind of uh, of cancer, which means it happens in almost all cancers, is a change in sugar metabolism. Mm -hmm. And you might have heard of PET scanning. I don't know if you've heard of PET scanning mm -hmm. where people get, you know, cancer treatment or when they find out that someone has cancer, they say, go get a PET scan. And in a PET scan, what they do is they give a cancer, a cancer patient or someone who may have cancer, a sugar, a special labeled sugar. And that sugar accumulates in cells that are sugar greedy. Mm. So they take in more of this labeled sugar and that traditionally is cancer cells. So then they do an image and they say, ah, like it lights up, you know, really bright right here and say someone's lungs. And they say, wow, they have liver, I mean, not liver, but they have lung cancer. Uh, and so they can tell because these cancer cells take in sugar higher levels. And so as I was studying in graduate school, it's like, okay, there are many different things that happen in cancer. And one of them is an increase in sugar metabolism, makes them more sugar greedy. So I said, let me see if a virus that causes cancer, can it increase sugar metabolism? And at the time it was something that was, wasn't really relatively looked at. It was, you know, there was people kind of studying other things with viruses, not as much sugar metabolism. So I started working on that and found out, yes, viruses increase sugar metabolism and also other types of metabolism like fat metabolism. And I, they use that as energies or, or building blocks mm -hmm. to make more of themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important for them. But in this, as a side process, it causes the cell to become more cancerous in its, its tendencies. Mm -hmm. So like fully cancer, but like kind of making it pre-cancer like. Mm -hmm. And so... I also looked at, you know, can we block it with drugs? Because there's, there are many um, meta anti-metabolism drugs that are found for cancer as chemotherapies. Mm -hmm. These are drugs that are used to treat cancer. So we're saying, well, you know, as I was doing research, if the, there's drugs that are used as chemotherapies that are anti-metabolism drugs that work against cancer, can we use them to fight viruses that cause cancer? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, at least that's what my, you know, I was able to publish and show and what my mm -hmm. current research is, current, is doing as well is we're looking at different um, anti-metabolism drugs and trying to find ones that have less side effects and trying to determine if these drugs can block virus production mm -hmm. and spread. And so we've had promising results with my students, which um, you know, we're hoping to get published in the next year or so. And we're um, excited for the potential of these drugs. I'm also um, likely in the next couple of months going to get, uh, I, I do the, a mouse virus because I also don't want, you know, my students getting infected and things. Uh, and so we do a, a virus that's very similar to the human virus, mm -hmm. a mouse version. So it looks like I may be able to get a mouse coronavirus to study in the lab as well and see if wow. these metabolic inhibitors can be used to treat mouse coronaviruses as well. And which would, if they work in mouse coronaviruses, they could possibly be used to treat human coronaviruses. Wow. That is like mind blowing. So fascinating. Really, really interesting. Um, and I'd love to share any, any links in the show notes to, to more specifics about your work in that, in that particular area. And actually, of course, mm -hmm. we're going to, we're going to include information about the TED talk and uh, you know, in addition to being a gifted scientist, you're, you're really a talented communicator. Your TED Talk was so interesting. And um, I want to ask you, know, why do you think you've been able to develop that talent for communications um, 
you know, on top of obviously your scientific expertise, oftentimes there's not, both of those talents aren't found in the same person, <laughs> right? Um, and, um, you know, any kind of, well, first of all, you know, kind of questions, how did you, how did you develop this, um, this dual talent? And then maybe thinking about what recommendations you might have for other scientists or engineers or any other professionals, you know, in, the, in technical fields who want to become better So for me, I think a lot of it has to do with being able to talk science to people who don't know science and like my community, my mom, my family. I mean, my, my mom didn't graduate from high school. My grandma didn't graduate from third grade, uh, Latino community and Latina, you know, Latinx communities. We, you know, there isn't a lot of, unfortunately, science education. And so you hear things in the news and you're trying to see, is that true or not? And you got to break it down to a way that they can understand. And so I found myself a lot explaining the science I was learning to my mother, you know, and trying to tell her what I was doing or also telling um, other people in my community what I was doing or learning. And so that's a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. You know, you practice and the more you do it, the better you get at it. Uh, so as that went on, uh, I also, uh, you know, it's important to learn how to speak to people who don't come from science backgrounds to, because science is important. It's important to know for uh, this every everyday life decisions. I think it's important for me as a per person who knows science to tell people about science so they can be educated as well um, in their decisions and the way they vote in other mm -hmm. ways as well. So uh, I did that through talking with my community. Uh, also through time, I got teaching experience I learned the hard way how not to communicate science and eventually uh, better ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through teaching experiences from graduate school. Uh, and then eventually I, uh, when I became a professor, I taught non-major science as well as kind of advanced senior level, you know, science or uh -huh. cell biology. Yep. So I had to be able to communicate biology from people who don't major in biology you know, who are taking it more of a general education requirement, hopefully uh -huh. exciting them about it a little bit through the class to, you know, uh, I'm trying to go to med school or graduate school type yeah. of students who are about to graduate with their biology degree. And so being able to have different types of levels is helpful. Um, I've also even done community outreach and done, you know, science stuff at like middle schools and elementary schools and high schools. So different, again, that different level of communication is really helpful because you, you could really you know, learn communication skills that way, even with my five-year-old, you know, talking science to him and uh -huh. in ways that he understands. So mm -hmm. the more practice you have, the better. And I, all, all those experiences have helped me learn to communicate science as well as hopefully bring some excitement to knowing about the science. You know, people don't want you to just talk jargon to them and they just kind of, you know, zone out. Right. You want them to you make it relatable, real life examples, uh, make it applicable to their life or the lives of those around them. And then it gets more of a hook to tell me more. And then through that, then you can educate them and um, make them realize that science is an important part of everyday life. Right. Oh, that's such important. Those, those nuggets of information are so valuable. And it's just a few that that stand out for me is um, one, of course, is the excitement factor. Like you, you underscored um, that importance. Get people excited about it more actively, you know, because they they maybe see that it relates, like you also mentioned, to their their everyday. Um, and then you know, you're kind of going up and down the scale when you're talking to um, people in the community who don't have a background in science, to maybe non science majors, and then, of course, to people who are on their way to, to med school. I'm going to really focus on this. I just have one kind of specific technique, and you've kind of touched upon it, but I'm wondering if maybe you could just tease it out a little bit. Um, let's just say in your community, or in a, it doesn't have to be your community. It could be any kind of general audience where people do not have a science background. Um, what are some of the tools that you reach for when you're trying to describe what you do, for example? Analogies. <laughs> Analogies are, are usually um, the best bet because you need to, again, you need to make it relatable to a level that they understand. Mm -hmm. So for example, an analogy would be 
a, you know, cooking science, doing science in the lab is like cooking. You need your pot and your pans and your spatulas. And if you're baking, especially it's very specific, you need your, you know, teaspoons and measuring spoons uh, and how you, if you mess up by, you know, make a teaspoon into a tablespoon, it can ruin everything. So just, you know, things like that, like, under, like that's how I would tell my mom how it worked in the lab. You know, this is how I would do things. And, you know, she's really interested. Uh, but again, if I just tell her, like, I use this piece of equipment and this piece of equipment, she's going to be like, what? You know, what's going on? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Oh. Um, but using analogies, I think, is a very powerful, powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Because if you're able to use an analogy that they already know, of course, culturally, it may be different. I may be talking about making, you know, tres leches cakes with tamales with mm -hmm. my Mexican, you know, background or, or you know, if depending on the cultural background or uh, of what people like to eat, you know, I could talk about mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. So it just depends. But using analogies that are, I think, culturally relevant mm -hmm. or relevant for the people who you're talking to are really helpful. Mm -hmm. And then they, they really can understand the picture that way, you know. Like when I was talking to a student the other day and I was talking about, you know, we have uh, in my lab, you get to do everything as an undergraduate. You get to run the project yourself. You know, you get to um, do all the experiments because I'm an undergraduate heavy university. Mm -hmm. Like you get to do everything versus in other universities. You know, you have multiple levels of positions and you know, you might do a little tiny piece of that project. I use the analogy of a seven layer cake, <laughs> you know, and you, there might be a chef and you know, that's making cakes at a bakery and you know, one person does one layer and the other person does the other layer and you get to do like that middle chocolate layer and everybody else does the others. Um, but in my lab, you do all seven layers. Like uh -huh. you're, you know, you're going to do every single layer and you're going to learn. I'm not going to rush you. You're going to start with the one layer cake, mm -hmm. then a two layer cake, then a three, but you get to do all of them right. eventually versus in other situations, you can kind of watch to the side. How do they make that cake? You know, mm -hmm. how, all I know is how to do a chocolate layer and that's all I know. You know, so like things like that, just being able to find analogies that relate to, you know, broad audiences from all culture. I think everybody likes cake. Right. Um, right. Versus, you know, if I'm talking to say someone, you know, um, like Latinx background or anything like that, um, I might use more like cultural food analogies or, or anything like that uh, as a scientist, you know, kitchen is the best <laughs> yeah. Yeah. because it's very, very similar uh, in, in there's equipment, there's measurements, there's incubation temperature times, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And thank you for, for really drilling down to that level of specificity. And even like within the analogy, how do you pick the right analogy? I mean, so important. Um, it creates that connection with a listener that you understand, you know, kind of their frame of reference, which, you know, I think opens up the communication channel for you to describe what you're doing. And like you say, it's such important. It's so important that people understand that science is has a role in their lives, even when they might kind of view it as some distant thing that people in lab coats do. Mm -hmm. um, as we wrap up, I want to ask you something. I want to add, sort of, you know, build on what we just talked about with a specific uh, question regarding the Facebook page that you. It sounds like you set up almost you know, in response to consumer demand or demand from friends, family, and people that you come across for information about the COVID-19 virus. And we had a chance to, to talk offline a bit about that. And I think it would really be helpful for you, you know, just to share how that came about and, um, you know, what, what sort of, you know, what kind of activity you're seeing on it and, uh, and those types of questions. Yeah, so I actually, so I made a, uh, professor Facebook page actually many years ago, I think maybe around maybe five years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And it was mainly for students if they wanted to, you know, interact on Facebook, to be truthfully honest, I didn't want them on my page, my personal page. I wanted to keep a little bit of a, of, you know, some privacy on that. Sure. Um, but I did want it, a, I did want to have a way to interact with students or other people in the community who wanted to, you know, know, know more about my lab. So I used it sparingly, not too much. Um, and then when COVID hit, I, on my personal Facebook page with my own friends, um, I realized that there was a lot of fear, which, you know, it is a scary virus mm -hmm. and a lot of misinformation. And I started off with just like a very casual PSA, you know, personal service announcement about a couple of facts about the COVID-19 virus. And people were just floored with it. Like they just wanted to know more. And it was really not just you're not speaking science right like in the sense of verbally speaking you're writing science down 
in a way that people can understand so that, you know, they're not reading these news, news articles that may or may not be swayed or hard to find what's, um, what's the actual facts uh, in, in, the, in the studies. Uh, and so, at least in a way that they can understand. And so I would just literally go to all the primary sources of the published studies and write it down for them mm -hmm. in a way that they can understand. And I think uh, mainly it was ma the accessibility for a way that they can understand. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the times the facts were there, it's just hard to find them, mm -hmm. you know, and understand how to interpret them. And so uh, I just started that. And then as I went through, it became so popular that I was like, I should put this also in my my professor page. So I just kind of duplicated every post I put on my professor page. I also put into my personal Facebook mm -hmm. page just to kind of have access for both parties of people. Uh, and they have been, you know, very much interacted with. And my goal again was just to give them information. I would say, who anybody have questions, like, let me know, and then I'll address them next time. And then, you know, of course, you don't want to make them too long because they don't want to read it because it's just too long. You know, you want to get to the point uh -huh. in a concise fashion that is understandable and that they can under, yeah, understand and relate or mm -hmm. con convey that information. So um, I started to do that through time and really it just became like a COVID-19 Facebook page almost at this point, just because that's pretty much what's going on right now. And I think in some ways it's been um, nice to keep active in reading science and talking about science because it's really hard to do that right now in COVID times. You know, you're home, I'm not teaching my students in person. And you're seeing all this information and I've had so many people who just say thank you you know for your information or people message me and ask questions um, and you know get things clarified that they hear you know hoax type conspiracy mm -hmm. theories <laughs> that have been, you know have you probably seen have circulated uh, through many different things so it's been a, a nice um, opportunity to be able to do that and I think in just like an honor as well just because you know I feel like I'm you know, I'm gifted in the sense I've spent this time learning about viruses, you know, through this many years. And the least I can do is help people understand them as well and understand this is a big, big deal right now because it's affecting everybody's lives, you know, whether you like it or not. You know, it's the, the whole world is being affected. So being able to make the right decisions for you and your family and things like that. Is, and, and it's not very difficult, I would say, but for a lot of people, if they don't have that science background, they don't know where to even start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's it's been something I've enjoyed doing just to kind of keep people updated. When I see new data, I share it. It might just be a couple sentences that I say something or maybe a longer post, but um, it's been a good way to keep people in the loop um, on what's going on. Such a wonderful resource. And even that you chose Facebook, I mean, I guess it's very much in line with what we were talking about, making it relatable, maybe even like non-threatening, you know, it's not mm -hmm. like I have to you know, it's, it's something that people are really familiar with. They use all the time. And now you're using that familiar medium um, to convey this really important scientific information. And you're out there finding it and then also translating it when it needs to be translated. And um, you can see the results. I mean, people are just really engaged and want to learn more and more about it. So yeah. thanks for doing that. I would also point. say... Yeah. Um, it's also a good way to keep in contact with my old community. Like I don't live in LA anymore, but you know, half the people on my Facebook community are from LA or from those type of, you know, the same type of background I came. And so being, you know, I, I use Twitter too, but I don't have that same, you know, type of people that I interact with on Twitter as I would on Facebook. So I think it's a great way to engage your community and the people that, you know, you interact with, whether it be virtually or in person. Dr. Tracy Delgado, thank you so much for being here. I mean, you're, it was such an inspiring, uh, engaging, you know, opportunity for, for us to have you on the show and to, to talk in such a compelling and powerful way about, you know, what you're doing now, how you were able to, to deal with some obstacles and really um, be such an effective, you know, scientist making such a huge impact. And you've got really interesting research results that sound like they're on the way or, um, and doing research that, um, that really can make a difference everywhere. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for having me, Mark. It was a pleasure talking to you and um, to everybody out there. And thank you listeners for being here on this episode of When Science Speaks. I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks.
This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world.